Well, hello there. Brent here with Bring Your Own Tools, and on today's episode, we are going to be installing this beautiful brick veneer. If you want to learn how to do it, keep on watching. Let's start it. Now, the one thing I've never really enjoyed about the front of this house is the fact that I have two different sightings. One that's obviously vertical and then horizontal. And my whole thought process behind this is that I want a really beautiful look with brick on this surface and I'll keep the siding above it just the way it is. That way I can have consistency, I don't have to worry about that siding, but I can also easily remove at least this front portion of the house to make it really pop and to look great later on. So first things first, let's remove the siding. I don't know if you're the same way, but part of me has always loved the demolition portion of a project. One, because I just love destroying things, and two, it's normally the easiest portion of any home remodel project, and this one is no exception. The only tools that I'm using for this entire removal is two hammers, which makes quick work of this entire process. And if you don't have these two sightings, because I know it's kind of a unique circumstance, just know that the installation portion of this project is universal and can be used in a plethora of different circumstances. I'm also trying to be as careful as possible not to damage the vertical siding because that's obviously going to be kept intact. But if you do happen to damage a few pieces, just keep in mind it's nothing that some wood filler can't fix later on. Just don't damage it too much. I also removed the existing drip edge over the garage doors, but I'll be replacing them with a brand new purdy looking drip edge. And there you have it, siding gone, and that was pretty easy. Now apparently Gold Bond used to also make sheathing for houses, which is interesting. And it's unique because we have the sheathing up top here, but we also have our concrete foundation wall below here. So we will have to do some type of differentiation between the two insulation patterns. Now we have to actually up install some flashing, some metal flashing like this, which is basically your standard Z or L-shaped flashing, which is gonna be going down below, up top, and even on top of this, like so, which is gonna be a nice, perfect little cap, making sure that if there is any moisture that gets behind the brick, it will actually come down and hit this flashing and peel away from the house, making sure it's not damaging your house in the long run. I place a bead of silicone on the back side of the flashing and then proceed to hammering in the new flashing right above the garage doors. And as noted earlier, I'm also applying the same flashing to my drip edge that's adjacent to the siding. Therefore, if there's any moisture that comes in contact with my siding and runs down, then it's going to hit that flashing and then peel away from the house because it's going to be extended past the siding and past the brick. This is an extremely important step to protect your house from moisture and water damage. So make sure you provide some type of flashing at this location. Since I'm only wrapping the front portion of the house, I then have to make some type of vertical transition between the horizontal siding and my brick. Now I gauge my depth with my circular saw and cut a small strip of siding off so I have a flat surface to work off of. As you can see, these two pieces of trim are actually different because it's more of an L shape versus a Z shape. And this is because I'm actually gonna glue these two together so I can have a seam on the side of my house that's gonna be biting up against the siding as well as up against the brick where it kind of has an ending point. So a little bit of kind of a makeshift type system, but it will work to make sure there's no moisture going down underneath the siding or the brick. Now I could have made it a bit easier on myself just by applying a very large thick bead of caulk after the brick is in place between the siding and the brick, but I wanted something that's more secure and more stable and will guarantee that I'm not gonna have water intrusion issues afterwards. As you can see, I also applied a bit of flashing tape at the very corner there, just as another protective barrier in order to reassure myself that I'm not gonna have moisture issues down the road. 
I do feel like I'm being slightly overprotective and you don't need this much protection, but it's better to be safe than sorry, especially when you're considering an exterior application in a very moist climate because Seattle is moist. Do people still not like the word moist these days? I don't know. Anyways, moving on. We are also applying some Tyvek home wrap to provide another layer of protection due to the fact that even if rain does not penetrate the brick somehow, that condensation could be created between the house and the cement boards that we're gonna be installing later on. Again, just another layer of protection that is cheap, easy to install with some G-tape, and therefore I can be rest assured that I won't have issues down the road. Now this is cement board, and this specific product is actually called Wonder Board. It's a fully cement product, so therefore you don't have to worry about any type of bacteria or corrosion on these, especially when we put some type of membrane on top of it, which we will be doing. You see it a lot on showers. We can use it for exterior purposes as well. We're gonna be using a diamond blade, which is a perfect way to cut this type of product. Just make sure you have a respirator. A diamond blade like this really does do an amazing job at cutting cement board extremely quickly and accurately. It also does a great job on brick, which we will be getting into shortly. But first, let's get these boards installed. And to do so, I'm actually using a specific screw that is designated for Wonder Board. I also picked up the longest ones that they provide because we're going through a number of different procs before we can get to studs. Just keep that in mind on your project. On a side note, if you don't have a grinder and you still want to install Wonderboard, you can score it and then cut it with a razor blade. Now, it's a lot easier to do with a grinder, but just know it is possible with a construction knife if that's your only way to cut this product. And as always, I'll be leaving links in the description box below on where you can find all of these tools and products seen on this video. They are affiliate links and they won't cost you any extra to click and purchase, but it does help the channel greatly. So the holidays are coming up and if you do need some spending, go ahead and try and help the channel at the same time by clicking those links and purchasing anything you need for the holidays. It doesn't have to be my crazy tools or materials. At this point, we have all of our Wonderboard fully installed and we need to apply some seam tape, but sometimes it's very hard to get seam tape to stick, especially on corners, and therefore I'm applying some contact adhesive spray first and then applying the seam tape. That makes it a lot easier to fully secure all the tape in place. I then apply some mortar mix to the joints to have a structurally sound joint and corner that I can work off of much easier in the long run. It also allows the transition between wonder board to concrete much more seamlessly because there is a depth difference. At this point in time, it's now time for Red Guard. This is a product that basically seals the cement board perfectly before stone or tile. This product can be used on an interior and an exterior application, but just make sure you're looking at the forecast and you don't expect rain for at least a couple days. This is just acting as our last protection measure against moisture, and I'm applying two coats of Red Guard and then letting it dry overnight before we start our brick. Now comes the real fun part, the actual brick lane. This, of course, is our thin brick veneer from Old Mill Brick. It's about a half inch thick. It's a real brick. And the beauty about this is that it has specifically flat pieces as well as 90 degree angles, which fits perfectly in our scenario. Now, it also really is a nice color. This is specifically Boston Mill, and it perfectly complements the blue and white exterior that I have in the house. So, there's only one thing we have to do. Let's get installed. One of the most important things when applying a brick veneer is your mortar mix. Now specifically, we are using Sackcrete Stone Veneer Mortar Mix, which is specifically designed for veneer brick. That's because it has a bit longer of a working time as well as it's perfectly designed for a vertical surface. 
As a general side note, when working with mortar or thinset, I always suggest applying the water first and then your mix because it's a lot easier on your drill and on yourself if you have a runny solution first and then you can mix it a bit thicker, add more mortar to it if you want, and avoids lumps in the long run because no one likes lumps. It's always good to start off on a good foot, which is why I take my six foot level and apply a couple lines to make the installation process a little bit easier. When applying your mortar to the back of any brick, you want to ensure you have full coverage as well as more of a peak in the middle. That way when you squish it down, it's not gonna come out the sides, it's actually just gonna build up from the back and have a nice solid flat surface. And there's gonna be less and I do mean less mortar that comes out of the joints in the long run. I am significantly back buttering these corner pieces just to make sure that we have proper adhesion because this corner is by no means a perfect 90 degree angle. As for applying the flat bricks, it's quite simple. It really is just making sure you have proper full coverage on the backside with a peak in the middle if possible, because just like the corners, when you push that brick into place, you want to reduce the amount of mortar that is seeping out on the top, bottom, and sides. At this point, you've probably also noticed that I'm working from top down and not bottom up. And in all honesty, I really do wish I was able to work from bottom up, but because I have such a unique circumstance, it was better that I work from the top down because I want a perfect row at the very top since that's going to be the more seen and more visible line that catches your eye. As I work my way down the wall, I proceed to applying a level line every three or four rows just to ensure that I have a proper gauge of where true level is. Who knows what true level really is other than Rick and Morty. If you actually do know that reference, please let me know in the comments because I'm actually quite curious as to how many do. Now the brick adjacent to the rock formation did make things a little bit more interesting because the fact that you really had to get those bricks up into those locations which was quite tight in some locations as you can see. But we may do and I think it's going to look really good in the end. As for spacing, it really was something that I generally eyeballed and in all honesty it was fairly simple to get an approximately 3 8 to half inch mortar joint on the sides as well as the top and bottom. In my tile work, I'm definitely very picky when making sure that my tiles line up perfectly, but with brick, especially with a more rustic style brick, I feel like it's only natural that it has more of a natural feel and look, and it doesn't have to look extremely perfect in every single respect. It might just be my opinion on that, and those true brick masons out there will be giving me some flack for it, but this is my house, this is my opinion, and I can give you a little hint. It turns out amazing in the end. Sorry, I didn't know how creepy it was gonna sound when I whisper in the microphone, but it really does turn out amazing. And the minute areas in which you can actually tell, I feel just give the house more of a character in the long run. A few of the really nice things about not having to worry about spacers is the fact that it's less time consuming and I was able to adjust on the fly in order to accommodate a full brick at the top and a full brick at the very bottom. That's nice. Now one thing you want to think about when cutting your brick is the type of blade you want to use. Now this is my standard grinder with a four and a half inch diamond saw blade. This is your normal cutoff wheel which doesn't really last very long. It does the job but nothing compared to this. So I would highly suggest spending a little extra money for a much superior blade. It just makes life a lot easier in the long run. As you can see this diamond blade cuts through this brick like butter and it makes a fairly nice corner. With the corner end on this side, I am basically cutting back slightly in order to accommodate the brick going right up against that trim that we installed previously. I am also leaving an approximate 3 8 of an inch gap between the trim and the brick because I do want to grout it. And leaving more space between the two actually helps the process of doing so. Ooh, as you can see, looks beautiful and fully secured. Now we're not obviously finished with our brick because we ran out of daylight last night. So let's get to that and then we can actually finish up the mortar joints after that. 
With the center column of brick, it was actually very nice because I was able to cut copious amounts of bricks at the same size and therefore the cutting and the dimensional aspect of trying to figure out what piece needs to go where was fairly quick and easy to replicate multiple times. Now that I'm done with the front portion, I then proceed to finishing off the side portion. And luckily this space is not very significant compared to the front. Very straightforward and a lot easier since there's a lot less cutting. However, there is still cutting because my concrete patio is actually sloped away from the house and it's actually slanted upward towards the steps. Therefore, I need to cut off small chunks on the very bottom row in order to fit appropriately. But again, very easy to cut, very straightforward, and I would just recommend to leave a bit of a gap at the very bottom between that and the trim because you still need to grout that edge. There are also brick cuts that need to be made once you get to the steps, my beautiful white steps that I did in my last video on YouTube, but as you can see, they have been getting a bit dirty due to the fact that it is fall and grouting will not help. However, that's what a pressure washer is for. Now that we have our new batch of mortar mix, it's now time to start grouting all of our joints. Now with that, we have our grouting bags. So basically if you're a baker and you love baking, which I'm sure there's plenty of people that watch this channel are, this is exactly it. You're basically using this as a pastry bag to grout all those miscellaneous joints and make it beautiful in the end. So let's start filling. This really is extremely easy to use. All I did was fill it up with my margin trowel and therefore you are ready to go once you twist that back end. And the back end twist is a thing of beauty but it did take a bit of time to perfect the method because you really can't just squeeze at the very tip there as I'm doing right there. You really want to actually twist the back side of the bag and push it out from the very back because you have more leverage that way and it's a lot easier to spread out thoroughly at that point. Now we're using the same mortar mix that we used previously to adhere the brick, but I did add more water to this mix in order to have it more flowable through the grout bag. Now after you let the product sit for approximately 10 to 15 minutes, I then go back and actually use this device. It's called a brick joiner and it's specifically designed to smooth out mortar mix within brick. Now in all honesty, this is my first section when I did this and therefore the mortar actually got a little too dry in order to have a smooth surface because this should look a lot more smooth than this. I fixed that by actually applying a bit of water to the mortar and then smoothed it out after that. I personally haven't done this in a while and therefore we all do make mistakes sometimes. But I did want to show you that because I also want to show how to actually fix that in the long run if you have the same issue. Luckily I was able to learn from my mistakes quickly and therefore the front of the house was a lot easier than the side of this house. I just had to manage a smaller section and if you work in smaller sections you're able to come back with your brick jointer in a more timely manner and therefore the mortar won't be fully set by the time you get back to it. At this point, after you let that grout sit for approximately a half an hour, I then come back with a stiff bristle brush and just wipe off all the excess grout. Now you want to wait a little bit before you do this because you don't want brush marks within your mortar joints. Therefore, if you are getting that, you need to wait a little bit longer for the grout to stiffen up a little bit more. Just keep that in mind as you're using your brick joiner because it's okay if the grout joints look a bit messy after you tool them because that's where the stiff bristle brush comes into play. Now this is a bit of an art form and it does take a bit of time and energy to get good at it, but once you get the hang of it, it goes extremely quickly and it's just satisfying to see for some reason. I think it's potentially the baker in me where I just love a piping bag full of mortar mix and having those edges fully seamed out beautifully in a very quick orderly fashion is quite satisfying, at least in my opinion. 
And as you can see from this section, this is exactly what you want to see with your brick joiner. It has a nice, perfect, smooth, crisp line all the way across and leaves a nice indent and impression because not only is the jointer actually providing a good, solid look and feel to your grout joint, but it's also actually pushing in that mortar into those seams and therefore you know those seams are filled and those bricks are more secure in the end due to the joiner. As we work our way across the garage, it is really incredible because it gives new life to this brick and you really can't tell that it's a brick veneer. That's the beauty of the brick veneer is because it looks like a fully secured brick wall. But lucky for us, we have the beauty of a brick wall, but without the struggle of hauling around a large amount of heavy bricks which I can personally appreciate. Now, as we get to the final section of our brick veneer, keep in mind that you can actually reuse this grout bag. You don't have to just throw it away because all you have to do, wash out with some water and you are ready to go for your next brick project. Go ahead and let this grout sit overnight and then the next day proceed to caulking all the edges needed to finish off this big, beautiful wall. But guess what? After we have that taken care of, we are done. This is a project that I've wanted to do for years and I absolutely love the finished look. It completely transforms the look and style of the house to something that's, well I can't say it's more modern, but it's more substantial looking which in turn provides a more inherent value. It's something that truly stands out and pops and I've already gotten numerous compliments from my neighbors which is always a good sign. This veneer brick is a game changer and it can completely transform not only exterior but interior projects as well. And that's what I call one beautiful, sexy beast. Oh yeah. <laughs>